Right leadership is real even when people do not serve God. Details of a king and the rise of the Babylonian Empire. All this and more coming up next on Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Stay there as we go through the Bible. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study and Bible Discovery TV. And I want to welcome you here. I am delighted you decided to join us today as we go through the Bible. Now, as we go through the Bible, we land into some very interesting studies today. They are, in fact, 2 Chronicles 27, Isaiah chapter 9 through 12. We are going to focus on 2 Chronicles 27, 1 through 9. We're going to talk about right leadership is real when the people are disobedient and do not serve God. What in the world is that about? Right leadership is real. Well, we'll talk about that coming up a little bit later on. But right now, Corey is here with Bible Discovery. Corey? Well, today I want to set the historic context to where we are in the scriptures. So the power is starting to shift from the Assyrian Empire to the Neo-Babylonian Empire. More on that in a minute. So the Neo-Babylonian Empire, that was like the new empire. It's very interesting. So as we look at that, so that'll be fascinating. Right. So do you know is your question, what That's is right. it? Well, here it is. Do you know how old was Jotham when he became king? How old was Jotham? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. If you think you know, stay there. As you read and study through the history of the kings and prophets of Israel and Judah, really quickly you'll see a power shift. It'll go from talking about the kings of Assyria to the kings of Babylon. Right now, we're discovering why. During the lifetimes of the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, the kings of Judah were experiencing troubling surges of major political change. The empire of Assyria that had been the force to reckon with for generations was threatening to topple. Its king, the grandson of fearsome Sennacherib, was fighting rebellion after rebellion. With his death, there was one final rebellion that would finally turn the tide. Babylon itself ruled by Assyrian royalty, rebelled against Assyria by declaring independence, while just south, a Chaldean chief named Nebuchadnezzar gathered his own troops with plans to take over the world. Babylon became the center of several years of tumultuous warfare. In the end, Babylon was taken by Nebuchadnezzar and his warrior son, Nebuchadnezzar. This new royal family allied themselves with the royal family of the Medes and Persians, and with this new military backing, began marching their way up the Euphrates River into the heartland of Assyria. Province after province of Assyria was taken by this new Babylon, until four years into the advance, the army reached the capital city of Nineveh. Here, a decisive victory was won. It's believed that the walls of Nineveh were compromised by the very source of life they had built into its design, the waters of the Tigris River. The Babylonian army dammed the river at key points to dramatically increase the flow of water to the city. With such an amount of water rushing into them that they weren't designed to handle, the foundations of Nineveh began to crumble and the city was overrun by soldiers. The king of Assyria somehow survived this destruction and joined by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt at a place named Carchemish was thoroughly defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, prince of Babylon. From this battle, Nebuchadnezzar marched back home to regroup 
take the throne and begin his advance against all unconquered lands. Now, what's really neat about uh, the history of the kings and prophets as they relate to and as they mention different pagan kings that they come into contact with is that they are very accurate, not only in their ordering of the pagan kings of Assyria and Babylon, but even in the transliterated spelling of the names. It's very cool and it lines up perfectly. Now, our study today will, will very much apply in the next few chapters of Second Chronicles as you continue to study and you see Pharaoh Necho and Josiah go going up to battle at Carchemish. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's really cool when we're able to synchronize the Old Testament of the Bible with ver uh, and verify them using the records of Babylon and Assyria. And it's true, it, I mean, really, the records of the Bible are accurate with mm -hmm. the records of real history, and that's very interesting. Yes. That fits well with the whole thing. Now, I want to tell people that you can help us, and we need your help. And if you can do that, then write to us or call us, and you can do that by writing to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania. And that's 15668-0150. Now in Canada, it's P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can call us then at 724-733-8336. Or you can call in Canada at 519 9408338 When Jotham came to power he was following a good leader Now his father Uzziah was a great king who followed God most of his life now the new king was a man after the heart of God who sought his presence. Jotham built the upper gate to the house of the Lord. He helped develop the walls built by Ophel. He was also a builder of cities in the mountains of Judah as well as a military fortress deep in the forest. He fought with the king of the Amorites. He defeated them. Jotham did quite well in the 16 years that he reigned as king over Jerusalem. Let's study on. Second Chronicles chapter 27 verses 1 through 9. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done, although he did not enter the temple of the Lord, but still the people acted corruptly. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord, and he built extensively on the wall of Ophel. Moreover, he built cities in the mountains of Judah, and in the forests he built fortresses and towers. He also fought with the king of the Ammonites and defeated them. And the people of Ammon gave him in that year one hundred talents of silver, ten thousand cores of wheat, and ten thousand of barley. The people of Ammon paid this to him in the second and third years also. So Jotham became mighty, because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham, and all his wars and his ways, indeed they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was twenty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. So Jotham rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. Second Chronicles chapter 27, verses 1 through 9. Bible Discovery TV and Quick Study Television, Rod Hembry here. This is an interesting day. We are looking at the king called Jotham. He is the 14th king of Judah. He is an interesting king. 
Now, in this passage, we're going to look at 2 Chronicles, and we're going to take a, a look at all of the things that are there. Now, just at the beginning of his kingdom, now he followed Uzziah, who was his father, and his father was a great inventor. Indeed, he was. So this man comes to the throne, and he assumes the place of king. Now, his 16-year reign will tell us something about who he is, what he did, and how he wants to work. Plus, the people of that time also did not turn their hearts after God. Now, what does that mean? We're going to talk about the right leadership. Let's take a look at the overview, and the overview is strong following. Now, the reading assignment is 2 Chronicles 27 and Isaiah chapter 9 through 12. The focus on 2 Chronicles 27 verses 1 through 9 is where we're going to go. Now, as we look at this, we need to pay attention carefully to the details and all of the things that are in 2 Chronicles 27. So with that in mind, we go to the scripture. So 2 Chronicles 27 verses 1 to 2 tell us this. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. Now his mother's name was Jerusha and the daughter of Zadak. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Although, you know, he did not enter into the temple of the Lord. Now that Uzziah did that, but still the people acted corruptly. Now, this is an interesting point that needs to be highlighted in this scripture. The king did what was right, but the people still acted a little bit out of control, a little bit corruptly, like they really weren't all there. Now that brings me to our very first point, talking about the right thing. The right leadership was evident in the king of Israel. He did what was right, but the people were still disobedient. Notice here that the leadership was right, but the people were still worshiping the gods that had been set up all over the place and still not truly worshiping God. Now, not all the people, but some of the people. So we have this tide of rebellion, if you would, in the midst of the kingdom. Now, that's important because we're going to deal with that later on in the rule. Now, with that in mind, we come then to the second point, and it comes up like this. This is 2 Chronicles 27, verses 3 and 4. It says, He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord, and he built extensively on the wall of Opal. Moreover, he built cities in the mountains of Judah, and in the forest he built fortress, and he built towers, now, I find that interesting because it shows here that the king is expanding the kingdom and he's developing the kingdom. And so he's making known to the kingdoms around him that he is conquering those very cities around him. Still, the people had that shade or that part where they really didn't serve God like they were supposed to. Now, how many of us know today that in America, that in Canada, that in the, the United Kingdom, wherever we're at, we have that issue? So that brings me to this point. The right moves were made to build the infrastructures to strengthen God's nation. But even the infrastructures, though they were strengthened, were not, did not actually make the people serve God. Now, that's important. It's important for the people to serve God. So he's doing all the right things and he's making all the right moves. And, and so far, it's pretty good. So now let's go to the third scripture as we consider this when we study the, the book of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 27. Well, the Bible says he also fought with the king of the Ammonites and he defeated them. And the people of Amnon gave to him in that year 100 talents of silver, 10,000 cores of wheat, and 10,000 of barley. Now, this is interesting because this is what people do when they're trapped in it. Well, then the Bible says the people of Amnon paid this to him in the second and third years of his, of also. 
Now, Joseph or Jotham became mighty because he prepared his way before the Lord God. I thought about this. The reason he became mighty was because he set out the kingdom for God. Now, isn't that interesting? This is a really fascinating point. We've got Uzziah, he's, you know, he's messed up. He's in the kingdom and he's put outside. But then Jotham takes over after his father dies. And when he takes over, he sets the kingdom up so that they actually are totally and completely turned to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, that's an important point as we come down to this last teaching. We come to the point, the right victories come into our lives when our ways are prepared before the Lord. And so here the king had set up the kingdom so that he would gather the uh, images of the kingdom and dedicate them to one God, the God of the Bible, and one God, the God of the universe, and one God, the God of everything. And because of that, it set the right motives. But still, the people did not totally serve God. And so, beloved, we come today to this. There is a fourth point that I encourage you to study it. But we come to this. The fact is that the right leadership can be in place in America, in Canada, in New Zealand, in Australia, wherever we're at. But unless the people totally give themselves to God, still there is that element of the fail. And so we need to give ourselves to God 100%. Now, there is this interesting character that shows up on the scenes uh, in the record of the Bible when it's talking about the kings of Judah and also in the book of the prophet Isaiah. But he also shows up in the archaeological record. The Bible mentions a foolish move of Judah's king Hezekiah. Ambassadors from Babylon have come to wish Hezekiah well and Hezekiah shows them all of the wealth all of the treasures of Judah and the Lord's temple. At the center of this history is one man from Babylon, Merodach Baladan. Merodach Baladan is very well attested to in history. He lived during the time of Assyrian dominance and he was a constant thorn in the paw of Assyria. A nuisance, a troublemaker that survived to pester three kings of Assyria. Merodach Baladan launched three full-scale rebellions against Assyria, in each one of them naming himself King of Babylon. There is at least one archaeological artifact that shows how seriously he took that role. A boundary stone has been found with a relief of Merodach Baladan giving a deed of property to the governor of Babylon, a job only the king could do. Merodach Baladin gathered his support base during the days of Shalmaneser V, the king in the Bible who began the destruction of northern Israel. He launched his first rebellion during the reign of Sargon II, the king who finished the destruction of northern Israel. He rebelled twice during the days of Sennacherib, once when Sennacherib first took the throne, and then again when Sennacherib marched against King Hezekiah. Merodach Baladan eventually grew old and died, but he didn't just leave the memory of his rebellions, he left a son who would grow up and launch a rebellion of his very own. None of Merodach Baladan's rebellions managed to overcome Assyria, but there is an interesting possibility that his bloodline is connected with that of Nebuchadnezzar, a king who finally did overthrow Assyria. All the Quick Study television programs in their full length are uploaded on YouTube one week before they air. Watch Quick Study on YouTube, and you can embed Quick Study in your website from the YouTube links.
How accurate is the Bible's history? Can we trust the Old Testament when it describes the kings of Israel? What are the archaeological discoveries that have opened up the world of the Bible, and how should we understand them? Join Rod Hembry and Corey Hembry Babechko as they discover the world of the Bible. In episode one, Rod and Corey will explore the reasons behind Israelite kingship. They will search out and explain archaeological finds that display the accuracy of the Old Testament. They will show you records from Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon that reflect biblical events. And they will show you the ancient signatures of some of Israel's most influential kings. Discovering the World of the Bible, Episode 1, is offered to you for a donation of $25 or more. If you would like to receive your copy, write to us in Canada and around the world at P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or call us at 519-940-8338. In the United States, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156. 156- 6680150 or call us at 724-733-8336 Thank you for staying with us and thank you for joining us on the program. It's very important that you do and we appreciate that. Now, next time on the Quick Study Television program, I want to talk about this. We're going to be talking about Micah 1 through 7. It's at seven chapters and we're going to be talking about the warrior God is angry at sin and we must look to him. Now, what does that mean to us today and how does that affect us today? God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. So how do we do that? And that's what we're going to talk about on the next show. It's going to be very interesting. All right. All right. So now we have, do you know, uh, do you know what? Yes. Well, these are details about a lot of the kings that we've been reading about. Do you know how old was Jotham when he became king? How old was Jotham when he became king, Corey? Hmm. Okay. I believe that the answer is 25. All right, now wait a minute. The answer is 25. Mm -hmm. Um, I happen to agree with that. You do? I think so. You endorse that answer, do you? I think I do. All right, well, she's absolutely right. And 2 Chronicles chapter 27, verse 1 tells us that, that uh, Jotham was 25 years old when he became king. Now, he reigned for 16 years in Jerusalem, and this may include the time that he acted as a regent for his father, the king, who, if you know the story of King Uzziah, was struck with leprosy later on in his years. Uh, Now, Jotham's mother's name was Jerusha, and she was the daughter of Zadok. Now, the name Zadok suggests that she may have been from a Levitical family, which is very interesting. And Jotham means Yahweh has shown himself to be perfect. I love the meanings uh, yeah. in these names that we read about. Yahweh is the name of God. Right. And it means the ever-present one mm-hmm. that needs no other conscious to com- complete him. It's, it's sort of a, that's a sort of a short story of it. Yes, but it's right. very interesting. And mm-hmm. so that's, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Now, Rod, a, a lot of our viewers hear you talk about a power guide. I know a lot of times when you're teaching, you talk about a fourth point that they can find in their power guide. And I wanted to show you a copy of that for any new viewers that we have. And some of you may be thinking, well, it's already almost the end of July. It's too late for me to to join. It's never too late to join. Even if this was December the 30th, never, never too late to join. A pocket guide is written every month, brand new material that helps you to follow with us along with the TV. And it also, by the time at the end of the year, if you've read from January to December, you will have completed reading through the Bible in one year. But don't give up. If you fall behind in your reading, that's okay. Just pick it up and keep going from where you are. Inside, you will find points. You'll find the reading assignments for today. It also comes with a discovery letter. You'll hear Rod talking about that as well during his teaching segments. There's all kinds of articles in here. There are the answers to the strength in your mind portion uh, questions that you'll see at the end of the program. There's a lot of things packed into this. So Rod, how would somebody get 
this power guide? Well, I mean, you can write to us. Uh, you can also get it online. And one of the things that we want to talk about is getting to us, a way to get to us. And let me get to the address. Here <laughs> it is on the screen. I didn't do that yet. But the address is P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. And the address in Canada is P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario. That is L9W5G2. Now you can call us at 724-733-8336, or you can call us at 519-940-8338. It's important that you call and contact us to get that. Ask for the Power Guide or the Bible Guide today. The truth is that when your work is recorded, you will be able to tell the difference between good and bad. Now, the Bible says that if you live your life well in attempting to please God, your record will show it. The challenge is life-threatening. If we learn God's truth, we will know that our ways will please the Lord over and over again. This is shown in Scripture. If we live for ourselves, then we die for ourselves. But if we live for God, then we live life forever. With that, we pray, Lord, teach me to follow your ways. I understand what it means to live for you. In our Strength in Your Mind segment today, we have a great Bible discovery question for you. Where does the Bible say, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. That's an interesting question because if you think you know the answer to that question, then you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Strengthen Your Mind. And when you click on Strengthen Your Mind, it'll take you to the great place where we have all of those uh, documents there and, and you'll enjoy it. But I want to talk to you about something else. I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ before we leave this program. This program is presented by Jesus Christ. That's the reason we do it. And the reason I present him is because he has made himself clear. He came, he died on the cross, and he rose again so that you could ask forgiveness of him. If you feel that you need to ask forgiveness of him, do it today and come into his presence. He will accept you. This program today was brought to you because of the resources of givers and discovery partners of Quick Study Television. Will you join us and become a discovery partner today? You can support us with an offering in any amount by going to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Thank <laughs> you.